Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, so this is Jeff Euling. Um, I'm the product management director at SyncSort um, here. I, I'm physically located in the United States, and joining me today is is our senior director from our marketing organization. Uh, her name's Becky Jelming. Um, we're going to be be talking about IBM I security best practices. Um, as we go through the presentation, if you guys have any questions as we go go through the presentation, uh, please add, add them to the chat box that you should see in your your webinar, and uh, we will answer those questions uh, toward the end of the presentation. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of, of background uh, about SyncSort. So SyncSort is a, a U.S.-based company that uh, has over the last number of years acquired a number of security uh, vendors for the IBM I space. Uh, also, SyncSort acquired Vision Solutions, uh, which uh, many of you know that uh, play in the, the HA area. And so we're very excited about a lot of work going on within our company in the security space. Um, we'll, we'll, we have many presentations out on our, our website that uh, introduces our products. Uh, we'll talk about at a high level of several of them today. Um, but if you're you're interested in understanding more about SyncSort, uh, certainly you can uh, reach out to our SyncSort.com website and take a look at, at what's out there. Uh, also, we are uh, a very big participant in common. Um, certainly Vision Solutions and the, the vendor products that we have acquired over the years um, through SyncSort. Uh, so it's Celosoft company out of France, uh, Raz, um, <clears throat> Enforcive out of Israel and Townsend Security out of the United States are all part of our, our security product umbrella today. Um, so my background is uh, I'm working in the product management area at SyncSort now, but prior to joining SyncSort last year, uh, I worked at IBM out of the Rochester Development Lab for many, many years, uh, leading the, the development of the IBM I security um, team out of the Rochester, Minnesota Development Lab. And so, so that, that's my background. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation now. So we're going to cover IBM I best practices, which is a, a broad, broad topic. And, and this presentation that I'm going to do today is a one hour version of the presentation um, at the Common User Group Conference in the US, I've been doing a two-hour session, um, but I, I have uh, certainly taken taken uh, the majority of the topics and and reduced the content a little bit to fit into the the one-hour time slot we're going to have here today. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, a number of different areas of security and the best practices around those different areas. And so hopefully uh, you will all enjoy the presentation, get something out of it, and uh, uh, certainly any feedback that you have, please send it, send it to me. All right, so the first uh, uh, topic that I like to talk about with best practices is, is a uh, kind of a kind of a straightforward um, topic from the standpoint of the, the skills that we have typically in the, the IBM I community, right? But we have a number of companies that, that are running, you know, very large IT shops, um, but we also have a lot of medium-sized and small companies that are out there today that, that are running very, very lean from a, um, a work, uh, worker perspective, right? We have many companies that, that run their entire IBM I shop um, with a couple of, of administrators, or sometimes even just one. And oftentimes, you know, those, those folks are, are spread very thin on all of the different areas that, that need to be covered, right? They're managing the entire hardware platform, all of the software, uh, keeping things up to date from a fixed perspective, you know, managing all of the third-party applications that are on the system. And oftentimes, you know, these, these companies, you know, they do not have the deep security skills that you need in order to do really do a good assessment of the security on your, your IBM I partitions, you know, your production partitions. And, and so from, a, from an assessment standpoint, I'd like to talk about 
about some some areas you know in the industry that that if you don't have those security skills that you can go and get help right so so in our large com- companies you know that run IBM I you know you may have your own security team there uh, that can handle an assessment of your platform um, but if you if you are struggling with with uh, security and you know that you need to take a look a deeper look at all of the infrastructure that you have you know your IBM I partition <clears throat> your networks you know all of the servers in your your environment whether IBM I or something else um, there are resources in available to help you uh, certainly the the IBM I security consultants at SyncSort are there to help as well you know, we have a consulting group um, in SyncSort that have deep security skills um, to be fair, there are a number of other companies in this space as well, the you know, IBM I vendor space that, that do the consulting as well, right? So, so you can certainly reach out to SyncSort or, or your favorite vendor if you have one um, and, and get help with an assessment, right? To make sure that you're looking at security from, from uh, a deep perspective. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, re- the reasons why that needs to happen. Um, from a network perspective, um, there are, are certainly skills available in the IBM I space as well. Um, there's also a, a very good team of experts from a network standpoint um, out of IBM. They're called the IBM X-Force security team. Um, this is a, a, a large group of, of consultants in IBM um, that focus on network security, which is oftentimes you know, very difficult to do from a from a smaller company perspective, when you don't have have those security skills and you don't have the deep network skills, um, that that getting a an evaluation of your network, maybe do some penetration testing, is really a, a very very valuable um, piece of work to have done to make sure that that your your company is protected to the the best of of uh, the capabilities. We talk one, about one slide from a from a physical security standpoint, and and what I'm talking about here really is you know as as a best practice in, in your company, you ought to think about you know all of the physical devices that you're using in your entire IT infrastructure, right? Not just IBM I, um, all of your your networking equipment, uh, certainly your servers. Um, you know, are you protecting those from from misuse from a physical standpoint? You know, do you have these devices in a locked uh, computer room or in a in a cage? You know, that some some user that has you know malicious intent uh, can't walk up and do things to all of these types of devices, right? You know, pop, unplug you know firewalls or change the configuration on firewalls, uh, mess up your cabling, your power. You know, basically trying to do something malicious in your company. Uh, also, from a you know a little bit uh, further perspective, you know, you talk about some of the the physical security for your external peripheral devices. You know, things like you know your tape drives or your printers. Uh, if you're still using physical fax machines, um, that that the the output or input from you know a co- incoming fax or a printed printed report. Uh, can certainly contain sensitive data, right? So customer information, prices, things like that end up on these devices. And if they're in a in a uh, an area of your company where where somebody can walk by and pick up a printed output or a fax, um, their your data may be on that output, and you know you need to be able to protect that. Uh, certainly from a GDPR perspective these days, which I'm sure many of you on this call are very interested in, you know, that's data, personal data potentially with names and addresses and so on. You know, you need to think about protecting that. Uh, physical security for mobile devices is a, is a very broad topic these days. Um, that's really, you know, if you get right down to it, it's a presentation by itself for the consideration for mobile. Um, but there's lots of things that, that to think about. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, right? So, so if you're using mobile devices, you know, whether that's a, a phone that has, you know, an a- app on it these days to be able to access your IT, uh, your laptop, et cetera, um, that there, there are a lot of considerations, certainly from a, from a security perspective, right? With wireless and so on. 
Um, but you also want to think about things from a physical security standpoint. Um, you know, for example, if you are using phones, you know, mobile phones in your your IT infrastructure um, where your users are using their phone to connect in, you know, you need to think about things like ownership of that phone. You know, what happens if, if uh, you know, you have apps on your phone and that, that particular user or person leaves your company? You know, do you have the ability to, to remove that app? You know, clear the data off the phone. Um, whose phone is it? You know, is it owned by the, the employee themselves or is it a company issued phone? Uh, if it's the employee's phone, then do you even have the ability to, to remove that application or wipe the phone? Um, so lots of considerations to think about there. Uh, if you're using mobile devices, you know, may want to, to investigate that a little bit deeper. All right, so we're going to talk about a, a very, very important topic now, and one that we see many, many, many IBM I customers, and I'm sure across the industry, regardless of the platform that you're running, that that folks really fall behind in this area. And it's really the the whole whole idea of staying current with technology. And we see that a lot with IBM I, where, where older IBM I releases really can't be kept current any longer uh, from a fixed perspective. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Um, and, and so as you, you are you know, running your business over the years and you fall behind on the IBM I release level, um, you have, have potential issues from a security standpoint that I'll talk about. Uh, open source really is is part of the reason that this is becoming more and more of a problem for companies. Um, the open source technology changes very, very rapidly these days from a code perspective, and things work a lot differently from a, from a support perspective with open source. Uh, so things like OpenSSL, SSH, Java, um, the web server technology, and so on. Uh, what ends up happening is that, uh, you know, the open source community, you know, just is, is at their own liberty to, to de decide how long they want to support different releases. And as you, you run open source on IBM I, um, the technology can change and oftentimes the, co the compatibility of the open source code changes as well. Right? So if you're on an old IBM I release and you have old, you know, old versions of the open source technology um, that, that even IBM cannot get fixes to that for that old stuff, you know, the version of open source that may be used on, on that particular IBM I release. Um, so that, that becomes a problem. And, and even if uh, you know, IBM was able to, to push the new versions of open source onto that old IBM I release, Oftentimes we see compatibility problems in that area where where something no longer works the same way and you can break things on that old IBM release. Uh, the same with hardware. You know, we see a lot of technology um, going into the new newer networking equipment. You know, so so things like firewall technology, intrusion detection prevention systems. You know, which oftentimes is a hardware appliance. Uh, not always. There's many software versions as well. Um, all of this type of technology really changes very, very rapidly, as we all know in this space. And so if you're using old network equipment, you know, you may want to consider moving up to, to something newer to take advantage of those technology advances that we see in the, the entire industry. You know. All right, so we're going to talk about staying current on fixes now, right? So what's what's happening in the industry? Uh, so when I was at IBM, I was very, very close to this particular topic that I worked a lot with, with the entire community across IBM dealing with security vulnerabilities that are reported either externally or internally by, by different groups within IBM. And, and what we're seeing these days is just an explosion of the number of, of security vulnerabilities that are out in the, out in the space today. Um, you can see a number of the, the code names for these vulnerabilities toward the top of the of the chart. Uh, one of the most recent and difficult issues was the Spectra meltdown support or issue that uh, was found that was related, really related to hardware technology. 
Um, what's happening is there there are many many uh, researchers out in the industry now looking for these types of vulnerabilities. You know whether they're they're network issues, um, the hardware issues that we saw with Spectrum meltdown, uh, many many issues with web servers and so on, and and lots of lots of researchers finding these and reporting. Right, so there are many many vulnerabilities. You know. Uh, many each day, you know, 40, 40 vulnerabilities a day is what's reported. Um, the other area that we're seeing a lot of vulnerabilities re being reported is with this open source code that is out there, out there in the industry today, right? So the open SSL, SSH, Java, et cetera. And where, where we're seeing these vulnerabilities, you know, they're being fixed by, by IBM for the IBM I platform. So lots of fixes coming out. Um, but these vulnerabilities are across the entire you know, IT infrastructure. So, you, so your Linux boxes, Unix boxes, Windows, um, all of your you know your hardware technology contains this code as well. Um, that uh, you know, we get these vulnerabilities. Uh, so lots of activity. So staying current, you know, is very very important. Uh, so on IBMI, you know, we see many, many vulnerabilities in Java, and plus the other technology that I have listed here, OpenSSL, SSH, the web servers, etc. Um, for example, you know, Java you know, comes out. You know, IBM, uh, I, the IBMI development team for for Java um, creates a service pack each quarter. And within that service pack, you know, when when I was still at IBM, I'm sure the this is has really maintained the same same cadence from number of vulnerabilities that that uh, every service pack, you know, we're seeing anywhere from 20 to 50 security vulnerabilities fixed within Java. Uh, certainly, some low severity issues, but also oftentimes a higher se severity issue in Java. Right, so you need to stay current, you know, with your fix packs, your your uh, uh, different uh, different fix strategy, you know, depending on the type of application. Uh, stay current on the you know the the cum and uh, all of the you know the hyper fixes and so on for security. Uh, very very important. Lots and lots of fixes coming out. And so I mentioned that uh, you know it's not just IBM I, right? I mean it's it's all of the infrastructure that you have in in uh, in your enterprise, right? So so if you think about the IBM I uh, client, you know, typical customer, um, certainly IBM I fixes for the OS, the license internal code and products very important, but it really spreads beyond that to the you know the BIOS partition, you know, if you're running AIX or Linux partitions. Uh, HMC firmware, et cetera, uh, plus the third-party applications you know, need to stay current because there's many, many fixes coming out for all of these areas in your infrastructure. All right, so the fixes from from IBM I, uh, obviously the IBM I Security PTF Group and the Hyper Group um, contains you know many of the fixes that are coming out for a lot of the technology. Um, the, the areas of, of IBM I also need to pay really close attention to are things like Java, right? That those fixes do not come in the, in the security or hyper groups, you know, that's separate download, uh, as is, the, you know, any I, IBM I access uh, fixes, which are, are becoming less, less uh, frequent these days as the move to, to ACS happens. Uh, web and application server, servers, and certainly all the Lotus products as well. Um, that these are all fixes that that are not part of the security PTF group or the hyper group. Um, they can't be, um, and uh, you know, from the IBM because of the of the installation requirements for those. Okay, all right. So stay current. Uh, also, if you have not subscribed to the IBM My Notification support. Uh, you should think about doing that. Which the, and what IBM I My Notifications is all about is that, that through the through the support group at IBM, they support the the notification capability. Where when IBM produces a security fix, um, you can get an email from IBM saying that that a new fix is available. Um, also have the access to the the IBM Tech Notes and so on. So it's a nice nice. Uh, uh, reminder that hey, if you haven't subscribed, you may want to look into this. 
Um, if you're looking for for how to do this, uh, you just contact the support center at IBM, and, and they can they can get you the information uh, on how to how to sign up for the notifications. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about about viruses on IBM I and ransomware and what the impacts here are from an IBM I perspective, right? So, so certainly that. Uh, uh, again, when I was at, at IBM, we saw a number of customers affected by by ransomware. Um, and typically, what what the, the situation was is that that a you know a customer would get a a ransomware virus you know running on their their Windows or Linux clients. And uh, the way that ransomware works is it really just follows the the available file system links. Um, into to wherever that leads, right? So if you think about a, you know, a uh, net server or you know a an, any type of uh, connection from a client device into IBM I, um, where you have access to a file system, you know, ransomware can take effect, right? So so what we saw was you know a, a, an infected client that had a net server connection or you know any file share set up that that what the ransomware virus would do is it would just go down that path and start encrypting data on the IBM I in the IFS. And so certainly the you know very important from a best practices perspective is to make sure all of your client software, you know, your Windows, Linux devices and so on, you know, all have antivirus software, you know, current antivirus software running on those to try to prevent this type of issue, right? So there's, uh, um, you know, very, very big need today to, to continue to run virus scan software on the client devices and, uh, you know, just as there has been that requirement for many, many years. All right, we're going to talk about the IBM I uh, server security now. And, um, on IBM I, there's a system value called Q security that's been around for for you know since the the very first release of AS400 way back back in the 80s, and and this particular system value has been enhanced uh, a number of times over the years to add add new security levels. Uh, we're going to talk about security level 40 and 50 today. Um, these are the highest security levels that currently exist on, on IBM I and really necessary that you run this high security level. Right. So what, why is that the case? You know, what happens at security level 40 and 50 that doesn't happen on the lower security levels? Um, and it's all, all about activating some additional security support that comes with your power hardware. Um, there's a couple of different things that, that happen. Uh, when you run security level 40 or 50 that do not happen at security level 30 or lower. And, you know, it, it, the security level 50 support, you know, the highest security level has been around since version two of IBM I, right? So many, many, many years. But you'd be surprised at how many companies out there running IBM I that still run at lower security levels, okay? But when you get to security level 40 and 50, you know, some support that's built into your, your power hardware is activated. Uh, we have a very strong capability on IBM I uh, called hardware storage protection and object domain checking. Um, these two areas are, are used to, to make sure that all of the IBM I objects, you know, your database files, your IFS files, uh, have very, very strong protection, right? There's no back doors into the object, you know, from untrusted code to be able to access the data, you know, without all of the, the security support for authority checking and audit being run. Um, the third category that uh, of protection that is activated at the high security levels is, is a capability called parameter validation. And what parameter validation is all about is, is having the, the operating system validate every single parameter that comes from a user application into the operating system uh, to make sure that, that all of the storage that is accessed by, by an address or a, something called a pointer out of uh, you know, different languages like RPG or C, uh, making sure that that pointer addresses storage that the user application is allowed to to access. The um, reason that this is important is that the the operating system runs at a higher privilege level 
than user code. And all of the, the internal structures that are used by the operating system to make sure the, the system runs as advertised and all of the data objects, you know, the database files, IFS files, are protected with something called hardware storage protection to make sure that, that user applications that are running on IBM I are using the, the system provided interfaces, the scale commands and APIs to access these objects and not going through some back door to try to get to data and skipping things like, like audit. The authority checking, you know, support at, at security level 50, you know, the, the, the capabilities that come with the hardware are very, very important to make sure that the system integrity aspects of IBM I are maintained. Uh, the lower security levels are, are just not strong enough um, to be able to protect, you know, the system and data objects in this particular, you know, day and time. Um, right, so at security level 40 and 50, you have authority checking in force, you know, all the object domain storage protection is is uh, is turned on in the parameter validation, okay. Um, the question I oftentimes get is, what the heck's the difference between security level 40 and 50? You know, why we kind of lump them together? And it's, it's really a history uh, reason um, that back when, when uh, IBM I supported security level 40, and that was the highest security level, um, there, you know, we introduced all of the, the object domain and storage protection checking and so on. Um, but what ended up happening was that the parameter validation was a was a very performance sensitive issue back many many years ago, and so we we created security level 50 really to to push the parameter validation um, into that security level um, because of the the performance aspects of it, and so so customers could continue to run at security level 40, get all the the object domain and storage protection um, that that was provided by the hardware, um, but parameter validation was only done at the highest security level. Uh, it took us a, a couple of, of releases to fix the performance problems that we actually had to get uh, some new support built into the hardware to be able to, to, to support parameter validation from a performance aspect. And once that was done, we moved the, the parameter validation support back into security level 40. So today, the, the two security levels are, are very similar. Um, and uh, But we really would like folks to move to security level 50 if you can. Um, and the reason for that is really from, a, from an auditor's perspective, it's always nice to be able to say, hey, I'm running at the highest security level. It's a very good way to to start your audit, and the, the two levels are very, very similar today. Really, the only differences are some very, very low-level buffer reuse uh, changes that happen on security level 50. Uh, we've never had an issue show up by a, from a user application in this area. Um, the other area that there are some differences are really with some very low-level message passing uh, checks that happen at security level 50. But again, um, we've never seen a, a user application issue. So, so move to 50 and uh, start your audit out with a, a really good answer that you're running at the highest security level. Right, so how, how is the, the protection all set up and why is it important, right? So within an MI object or an object on IBM I, whether it's a database file or an IFS file, there are a number of very sensitive security attributes that are stored in the object itself. And things like the, you know, who owns the object, what the public authority is, and so on. And so protecting the objects, um, you know, from the standpoint of not allowing somebody to modify anything in the object header, very, very important. Um, this, this is an area that's actually very, very well protected. Um, it didn't used to be, but over the years, a lot of support was added into IBM I to make sure that, that this part of the, air, the object is very, very well protected. Uh, in fact, today on IBM I, if you're running, you know, a release after 6.1, um, all of the, the the header area is only modifiable, by, modifiable or readable by the license internal code, right? So even the operating system doesn't have access to this area. And so any change to an object owner or public authority um, needs to be passed, uh, you know, from the user to through the operating system down into the license internal code to make those changes. 
Uh, the same is true with the, the bottom part of this object, right? the encapsulated data segment. Um, this is where the, the data from an IFS or a DB2 file is, is stored. Right, so this is also an area that very, very well protected. Only the license internal code has access. Uh, not quite so true with the, the middle part of the object here, something called the associated space. And it's, it's where the operating system stores lots of information, you know, for a given object type, right? So things like CL commands, you know, you'd see, you know, all of the parameter definitions stored here, you know, what the values are that you can specify on the parameter and so on. A uh, data area would be be the you know the information you know, what type of data area is it character uh, logical decimal um, and the data itself is stored there for a data area right so so very important to run at the the highest security levels to make sure all those different different areas of the objects are protected. All right, so we're gonna talk talk real briefly about SST and DST. Right, so SST the the system service tools. Um, has a lot of, of very, very sensitive tools that, that one can access if you're able to, to log into SST, right? It requires a, a user ID and a password, uh, same with DST, to be able to, to get access. Uh, but within the service tools, there are some, some very powerful um, service-related interfaces that, that can expose data. Um, so keeping, keeping users out of the service tools is very, very important. Um, you can use a CL command from the, you know, the command line called display SST user uh, to take a look at all of the, the user IDs that are currently enrolled, right? So there's a, a separate user registry, you know, you can create SST users um, to, to have access to all those service tools that are, that are out there. And, you know, so, so kind of harp on this a little bit, but, but very important to protect this, right? Because in that tool set, you have things like, the ability to trace communication lines, uh, be able to access storage on the system directly. And, and once you're in the service tools, um, there is no really no audit capability, right? So you're not getting a good audit trail of, of what's happening with those tools. Um, the reason for that is really that these are so low level that, that really a lot of these tools can run, even if you don't have the operating system installed, right? So if you're having issues, you know, bringing up a machine, um, you know, IBM will use these tools to be able to do debug and so on. Um, but there are a lot of very sensitive, you know, interfaces in there, right? So take a look at, at who's enrolled, make sure that they, they are really the folks that should have access. Let me talk about system values, right? So we, we have three system values we're gonna talk about that, that really control access of what happens when you're restoring executables, you know, so programs and service programs onto the system. Uh, this is where we see a lot of issues over the years with, with, with different folks or even some vendors trying to, to alter, alter things to run a little bit differently than really is intended by, by IBM and, uh, you know, the support in the operating system. Right, so the, the three system values we're gonna talk about, Q allow object restore, Q force conversion restore, and Q verify object restore. Um, these system values work together and during a restore, object restore operation, right? And so, so anytime a, a program is restored onto IBMI, uh, depending on the values you have set in these system values, you know, different, different things will, will occur. Uh, different checking by the operating system to make sure that that the program that's being restored you know hasn't been been modified. So the 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 main system value, really two system values you want to take pay a, a close close attention to, right? So so that the idea from a best practices perspective here is you know you're running your production machine, right? So you're you're outside of your your normal maintenance um, window right where you're you're running your production applications um, and you really don't want you know changes to be made you know to the system when you're in this environment um, setting these system values to to the very strong values right so for QL allow object restore uh, set the system value to star none um, Q force conversion restore uh, consider the value either six or seven and what ends up happening here is that 
that uh, any program that has a security issue or a potential security issue um, can be blocked from being restored, right? So, so things like, you know, if uh, somebody's trying to restore a program and ops authority, right? So to, to, to elevate the authority at runtime, um, you can block that type of program from coming onto the system. Uh, the Qforce conversion restore, what this is all about is, is it, it's, it's a, a system value that, that really will, will remove any patch or modification that's made to a program. Right, so if somebody is is gone in and, and altered the instructions of a program, a couple of ways to do that. Um, Force conversion restore will will actually recreate the entire instruction stream um, at restore time if you have the the value of six or seven set. So so very strong protection. Uh, verify object restore. You can go in and read about this. Um, this this system value was really built for controlling. The digital signature support on IBM I. Um, unfortunately, that technology really never took off for for IBM I. Um, so we see very few customers or vendors that do any digital signing of their their executables. But you can read about that and consider value five here as well. All right. So the system, you know, the the system value is very important. But you also want to take a look at that the commands that are on your, your IBM I or the interfaces that, that allow you to restore objects and to, to save objects, you know, save data off the system, right? So, so when IBM ships the, the restore interfaces, they're all shipped as public exclude, okay? Which means, you know, you have to open up the commands to allow uh, an operator or somebody that's not a security officer to, to use these interfaces. Uh, so take a look at, you know, through display object authority or edit object authority and make sure that these interfaces are set up with the correct level of authority and that you're, you've only authorized the users who really should have access to the, to the system. Uh, the same is true with the save commands, uh, plus all of the, all of the dump and trace interfaces that, that exist on IBM I. These are all shipped with public authority exclude uh, and really should be that, right? Because if you can dump objects or trace trace different information, you could potentially see data that, that a user should not normally see or isn't authorized to. Uh, the save commands are a little bit different, right? That, that you want to consider the save interfaces as well, right? So as soon as somebody has authority to do a save object and you have read authority to a database file, you're able to save it. Um, and, and potentially take that data off the system, right? So you have to consider consider locking down the save interfaces as well. We'll talk a little bit about, about audits and really the, again, this is similar to the, the mobile device issue that we talked about earlier, right? It's really a separate presentation um, to get into the auditing support in, in detail. Um, there's a number of system values you use to set up auditing on IBM I. Um, you can take a look at Chapter 9 of the Security Reference PDF that's out in the Knowledge Center to get more information about these system values. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about uh, you know, how to set it up just real briefly. Uh, very easy to, to get uh, auditing turned on on the system. Um, we're not going to go into all of the, the, the capabilities of audit in the presentation. Um, but you want to kind of talk talk through this as a company, you know, make sure you have the, the right level of audit turned on. Um, so the, the system level of auditing, you know, controlled by the system values, you know, control all of the, the higher level categories of audit. Um, this slide's talking about, you know, the, the data itself, you know, being able to, to manage, you know, the, the data that in, in audit changes of the data, right? So, so the system auditing gives you a, a good view of who's accessing a file, right? It'll tell you that, uh, you know, user Jeff opened DB2 file or the stream file, um, you know, for, for modification. Uh, but the audit support part of the operating system does nothing to keep track of what changes in the object. And so a combination of the security audit, you know, gives you, gives you who's opening the file, who's, re you know, opening it for read or change. Uh, but to, to actually get the changes logged, you need to go in and start up journaling for those sensitive data files. Uh, many of you may have this already turned on, you know, if you're using high availability software, um, that, that more, more than likely you've got journaling of the, of the data, data files set up. 
Um, but you want to take a look at this from a security perspective as well. Um, this is how you would track, you know, what's changed in the, the DB2 or IFS file that uh, contains your sensitive data. Um, if you if you were looking for additional capabilities to help you with the monitoring and reporting, um, SyncSort uh, has a, a variety of products available to, to monitor and uh, control access to your, your data, uh, be able to, to help you mine the data out of the audit journal and database journals, and, in the, and even to, to be able to push all of this data out, out to a to a scene device, you know, a security incident event uh, manager capability, you know, things like QRadar, Splunk, ArcSight, et cetera. The password composition uh, system values still very, very important. Uh, you want to make sure you take a look at the uh, Q, you know, all of the system values. They all start with QPWD. Um, you can see them all with a, a simple work sysval. Uh, QPWD. QPWD asterisk, take a look at the, the capabilities that you have set up. So make sure that you are, are using uh, passwords with, uh, with a length you know, of seven or eight or greater. Uh, take a look at you know, the different composition rules to make sure that trivial passwords are not being used on, on IBMI. Uh, there's also a, a CL command called analyze default password. Uh, you may want to run that occasionally to make sure that you don't have any users set up with uh, with passwords that are defaulted. Um, still a problem on IBMI after all these years, uh, but you can take a look at that command and and uh, see what your your configurations looks like on your your IBMI systems. Uh, plus a lot of additional system values that are out there that you can take a look at. Uh, do a work sysval, star set, and you'll see the entire list of, of security system values. Okay, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, locking down your data objects now. Okay, so very, very important from a security standpoint. Uh, probably the most important area to make sure that your data on IBM I is really locked down. And if you, you think about uh, about things from a, from a data security perspective, right, is that the first thing you really want to do is to make sure that, that only the users who should have access to your IBMI are, are in, you know, being controlled, right? And, you know, the, the SyncSort products, again, we'll, you know, we have a, a wide variety of products to help you keep people out of your IBMI, right? So, so a very strong product that, that protects things from a network layer. Um, take a look at, at that capability. Uh, plus, you know, once the, those users are on the IBMI, um, we have products that, that allow you to set up a, an additional layer of protection on your IBMI product, uh, IBM, IBMI objects, right? Be able to lock down, you know, interfaces, lock down database, et cetera. Uh, plus, a uh, a strong multi-factor authentication uh, product as well, right? To to provide you know that additional layer of security for folks logging into IBMI. All right, so so a lot of different different things to consider from a security standpoint here, from a from a you know protecting your data aspect, right? So. So if you think about things from a, from a layered security approach, right? That that we you know, we talk about uh, you know making sure you lock down your network, um, deploy that network security product, right? You know, so SyncSort provides that product. Other vendors in this the IBMI space do as well, really to be able to lock down different interfaces into IBMI. You know, your database servers and so on. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, uh, another another very very interesting product that that comes from SyncSort to help you lock down that that login to IBMI. Um, then there's a number of capabilities to, to to secure data on IBMI, and we'll talk about several of them here in the presentation. Um, then encryption is another layer. Again, we'll talk about that here in a minute as well. And then certainly auditing and monitoring of the of the data access in your IBMI configuration is very, very important. All right, so the, the IBMI, you know, provides a, a really strong layer, you know, of the base security infrastructure, right? You know, that being able to lock down data from a, you know, who's authorized to the data perspective, um, all of those type of capabilities and audit, audit the objects and so on. 
Um, but you know, we really want to think about about things from from one perspective, right? So if you have a have a um, an intruder that's trying to to hack into your your IBM I, um, they've penetrated your network, and now they're they're trying to access data that sits on your servers, right? Um, that if this if this intruder is able to gain access under a user ID that has complete privileges, right? So your security officer, you know, the the capabilities that are part of the operating system really can't prevent that user from accessing ask, accessing your data, right? That they've they've hacked in with the security officer profile and they have full access. And so that that's where the layering of, of protection really becomes very, very important, right? I mean, you can you can use these products that that allow you to to lock down, you know, how that user can gain access to the IBMI, right? Keep them out of your database servers and so on. Um, but also being able to to do things like add that additional layer of security, being able to monitor, you know, who's accessing what data objects on the system and so on. Um, all of these these capabilities really are are built on top of the capabilities provided by the operating system. Um, but the operating system really hasn't taken the you know the, these type of layered approach to the additional capabilities, right? So that that network, you know, monitoring and uh, protection, access control protection product, um, the deep monitoring and reporting capabilities, multi-factor authentication, and so on. Right, all of the capabilities are enabled by the operating system, but aren't implemented. Right, so very, very important to, to keep the the number of security officers to a minimum on your system. Right, so this level of user ID has access to to every object on the system and makes it very difficult to enforce security obviously if you have have that security security officer level of authority you know for your users right so so you try to keep those to a minimum uh, there are, are a number of products out in the, the vendor community including one from SyncSort called elevated authority manager that allows you to, to set up an environment where your end users have minimal amount of authority, all right? So they're not security officers. Um, and when they need to do a task that requires additional authority, um, these products like the Elevated Authority Manager allow you to, to perform that task using a, an elevated authority or el elevated privilege and and while you're doing that task, you get get logging of, of the fact that this user, you know, Jeff, has been you know using an interface that typically they wouldn't be authorized to use, right? So you get some really really nice logging capabilities there, kind of an audit trail of of, of uh, activities that that this user is performing. Um, so really nice products out there to be able to do this and try to keep the the number of privileged users to a minimum. Uh, also, there are in the in the audit capabilities. There are are ways to to set up additional auditing at the user level through the change user audit command, uh, where you can go in and say, you know, for user Jeff, I want to to log, you know, things like all the security changes this user makes. Um, use the star command value that gives you a nice view of all of the sealed commands that this user is running. Um, all of this is logged to the the security audit journal. And then certainly the the data that ends up in the audit journal um, is sometimes difficult to extract, and right, and that's where the the vendor products come into play. Um, that there are are a number of products out there that allow you to to pull data out of the audit journal, produce reports, uh, produce nice graphical interfaces, you know, a nice view of the data, and be able to search for different different uh, events that have occurred. Right, so so protecting your objects, you know, very important. You need to run at that high security level. Uh, make sure that you lock down your sensitive data objects, right? So so set public authority to exclude, you know, for those sensitive data files, um, and then certainly the, the add the additional layers of security as well, right? So you you know use all of the operating system capabilities, and then you can add on the you know the network layer of protection, the audit. Multi-factor authentication, certainly all the, the monitoring and reporting capabilities to make sure you're you're actually looking at at things on a daily basis to make sure that that uh, things are working as you have designed. 
Right, so there's a capability that was added in the 7.2 operating system release that, that also helps with, with uh, you know, controlling access to data. So, so a capability called row and column level access control, um, it's, it's really the ability to, to take a DB2 file and subset the data that different users on the system are allowed to see. Right, so the typical, typical DB2 file, if you have, have public authority of use, that, that every user on the system is able to, to look at all of the data in the database file um, by default. And so if public authority of use, you can you know, displace physical file member, take a look at all the data. Uh, what role and column level access control will do is, is really subset that data to only allow the user the ability to see certain records or rows in that file uh, or be able to see the data in the individual fields or columns, right, to be able to mask that data. Um, if you're interested in learning more about RCAC, there's a very nice red book. I got the link here. Um, you can take a look at the red book and, and see, you know, kind of what uh, what the capabilities are, uh, how you implement them, and so on. Um, so here's just a real simple example where, where I've got uh, um, just a little run, run SQL window, uh, run SQL script window set up. You know, I'm doing a select of all roles from a, from a table uh, or a file. Um, and I've got things set up to say, oh, you know, user Ulink can only see, you know, the data associated with, with, uh, with Jeff Ulink. And, you know, so you could set things up to, to be able to, to limit what rows are, are being looked at, uh, plus be able to mask out data like the social security number field that I said I have in this example, where you have the X's over, over part of the data. <coughs> All right, so talk about uh, um, one capability that came in in 7.3 uh, within the operating system, a capability called uh, called authority collection and, and what this this interface is all about. It's part of the operating system, free free uh, part of the operating system if you're on 7.3 or later. And it really gives you the ability to, to take a look at, at what authority you have defined on your IBMI system uh, for your different data objects. A very, very nice capability. Um, the, the real, real um, advantage of using this capability is what, what will happen is is when you turn on the authority collection and run your application, the operating system will log data about the objects being accessed, and it will tell you what authority is really required to run your application you know, for each of your data objects, right? So if you got database files or IFS files, you run your application and the, the operating system will gather data and tell you, here's the minimum amount of authority that needs to be granted for this user for the application to run. Um, this allows you to, to take that data and go in and, and actually change the authority of your objects. Change the authority of your objects on IBMI and, uh, and make a, a much more secure environment. Uh, it's you know built into the operating system covers all the file systems on IBMI. A uh, very low runtime performance uh, consideration, right? It degrades the performance a couple of percent. Um, this is a tool you can turn on and off, right? So you can test your application, uh, get the data you need, make the authority changes, and then uh, turn it off and continue as normal. So what, what does the data look like? Right, so the, the operating system gathers a lot of data associated with your application. So it's gonna, gonna log, log data for things like you know, CL commands, programs, database, you know, many, many objects on IBMI, and we'll, we'll generate a, 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 basically a snapshot of all of the data that, that is associated with, with that application at runtime. And then you can go in using a something called an SQL view. Um, in this case, the, the SQL view for authority collection is qsys2.authority underscore collection. And in this example, you know, I'm just grabbing the the data, you know, for for the user Fred one when they ran that application. And within the data, you'll see you know, the objects that are being used, and more importantly, what the 
the minimum amount of authority that is required um, in order to run that application successfully. All right, so you can take that data, um, go change the, the authority on your objects, you know, to, to lessen the authority that's been granted and, uh, and still allow the application to run successfully. Here's the, the, you know, as you scroll through the authority collection data, here's the required authority for this particular example. And I talk, talk a little bit about encryption now, right? So encryption is another layer of security that you can, you can add to your data, right? And, and uh, encryption is really the, you know, the process of taking data that's, that's readable by, by a human and changing the, the data in a way that that the data is really unrecognizable, you know, by the human, right? I mean, you're still able to read the, the data, but really makes no sense, right? So you take a, a good example always to use here is a credit card number, where you've got, you know, a clear text credit card number stored in a, in a database file, you know, certainly a big security issue these days and a risk. Um, you can use the encryption capabilities to to take that credit card number and transform it into something that no longer really looks like a credit card number. Um, the way that this is done is is using really really a couple of components that play into the the encryption capability, right? So you've got an encryption key, and you also have have something called an encryption algorithm. Right, so encryption algorithms have been around for, for many, many, many years, right? So uh, algorithms like DES, triple DES, um, the, the more recent algorithms that, that uh, are very commonly used in the industry today is a, an algorithm called AES. It stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, that's kind of the state of the, the art encryption algorithm. Uh, very, very secure, uh, performs much better than, than the older al algorithms. And, uh, and, uh, but, you know, the, the key, you know, the, the, the definition of the authority algorithms, though, is that, that these, there's nothing secure about them, right? They're, they're very much public, right? They, you can go to the library, get, a, you know, a textbook and, you know, look at, you know, how the, the encryption algorithm is implemented. What makes encryption you know, secure or adds that that value to protecting your data is something called the encryption key, right? So the encryption key is a is a a, up, a string of data that that you know you can use um, you know a system API to create the encryption key that you want to use. It's it's just a random um, piece of data, and combining that with the encryption algorithm and the data that you want to protect. Um, is how the encryption support works, right? So you you decide what encryption algorithm you want to use, create the encryption key using the, the interface provided, uh, either through the operating system or a product, and then you go ahead and, and run it through the encryption algorithm, the data, and uh, the output is that credit card number that is no longer readable. From a security standpoint, you know, protecting the encryption key is really the, you know, where you get value in, you know, in encryption and protecting your data, right? So if, if you're able to, as a hacker, you know, if your encryption key is compromised and somebody has access to your encrypted data, they really, you really haven't provided any, any additional security, right? Because now you can take that encryption key and run the decryption interface and get the, you know, the clear text credit card number back. Right? So protecting the encryption key is very, very important. Um, the the master key. Okay, so the way the way the encryption keys are all kind of put together is that that a that a encryption key, you know, once it's created, you know, needs to be kept secret. And if you can't do that, then you really haven't provided any value. Uh, eventually, the you know the the way that encryption keys are protected is by the use of something called a master key, right? It's that that top level key that that really can never be be exposed, or you're going to lose all of the security benefits with encryption. Um, the master key has to be kept kept secret. Um, the the diagram of of what I have here is that. You know, we create some key, uh, encryption keys, you know, to protect data. 
Um, the key encryption keys is really just another layer of, of data encryption key where you're you're encrypting the prior key with another key, right? So now you have two keys that, that kind of are used to unlock the data. Um, and then the top level key is the master key. Um, very important. This is the is the key that's in clear text, right? It's there's nothing protecting this key other than where the key is stored and what security is around that that storage, right? So very very important uh, to keep this key key secure. You know, IBM I has interfaces to create master keys and key store files and encryption keys. Uh, SyncSort also provides a, a very very nice key management capability where you can take your encryption keys and actually take them off the IBM I box itself, off the off your partition, and store them in a in a key store. Um, and then at runtime, you know, using the SyncSort products, um, you're able to to access access those encryption keys during runtime. Um, and uh, the the key management capability capabilities are, have actually been been evaluated and have have a, a FIPS 140-2 certification. Uh, so very strong capabilities that you can get from SyncSort. Um, you can't with the base operating system support. Uh, the algorithms, you know, that uh, are are there on part of the the IBM I as well, right through API interfaces. Uh, SyncSort also provides a, a product where we we've, we've done. Um, the National Institute of Standards, the NIST compliance uh, testing of the encryption algorithms, right? So with the SyncSort product, uh, you have the, the compliant algorithms, plus you've got the FIP certified key management solutions, you know, to be able to protect your, your uh, encryption infrastructure and get that layer of protection added to your data. In the uh, 7.1 operating system release, uh, IBM created a, a capability called DB2 field procedures, and uh, this is a, a capability that's that's really really nice from a uh, encryption standpoint. It allows you to get data within an application, you know, so data stored in a DB2 file, uh, get that data encrypted without actually having to go in and make major changes, oftentimes no changes to the application itself. Right, it's it's a, a capability that's built into the the DB2 engine within the operating system. Uh, the, the operating system enables the, the capability, right? So you you have the ability to add a, a DB2 file at a at a field or a column in that file, define a DB2 field procedure, which is really saying, you know, I'm, I want this program to be called. Anytime this database is accessed, this field in the database is accessed, and what ends up happening is, is at runtime, uh, the database engine will call out to that exit, okay, and and the exit can then implement the encryption support for you, right? So it's basically a you know encryption on the side of your application. Uh, the operating system provides the, the interface to be able to, to invoke the DB2 field procedure, um, but they really don't implement any of the, the actual capabilities, right? So typically the, the vendor community in the IBM I space has been, been uh, uh, creating products to, to enable this capability for you. Uh, certainly we have a very, very strong product from SyncSort, uh, but there are also a couple of other vendors in the space that that have uh, DB2 field procedure capabilities as well. All right, take a look at that if you're you're interested in getting some of your data encrypted um, before you start down the project. You want to take a look at the the vendor solutions. Also within SyncSort, we have a have a product that provides the ability to to create uh, an environment that's somewhat similar to encryption called tokenization. Uh, the payment card industry, so the PCI uh, standards that are out there that uh, a lot of vendors and, and customers need to comply with um, has the, the ability to create um, a solution called tokenization, which is really a, a very nice way to, to implement protection for sensitive data, um, credit card numbers, certainly the, the target from, from the payment card industry standpoint. Um, but essentially, the way tokenization works is that 
that you're creating a a token that represents the the credit card number. Uh, the credit card number will be stored outside of your your production partition, uh, typically in something called a token vault. And in its place, you know, during the app within the application, you'd be using the token that represents the credit card number. The token, the token itself uh, looks like a credit card number. You know, we have have uh, uh, token capabilities that that basically create a representation of the credit card number used within the application. Um, but the token itself really provides, you know, no direct link to the credit card number from a from a reverse uh, engineering standpoint, right? So you can't take the co the token itself. And get back to the clear text credit card number uh, like you can with encryption, right? So it's a it's a really strong way to to improve the security, you know, of an application that's that needs to deal with the sensitive data. Uh, IBM I's uh, operating system really has no support for tokenization, but again, the vendor community, including SyncSort, uh, has the products to help you in this space. Uh, there's also a, a number of capabilities that that are implemented by uh, within IBM for encryption of data at rest. Uh, so we're talking about you know encrypting you know full disk encryption uh, and also encryption of your backup. Uh, if you're interested in any of these type of solutions, you know you can look at the IBM capabilities for this. Uh, certainly look at the hardware capabilities, right? So for for encrypted disk. Um, the, the hardware capabilities are are enabled by the the SAN technology in IBM. Uh, the encrypted backup is really the the capabilities that are there uh, for um, you know for the tape solution. Again, look at the the hardware support. Right. So just to to conclude here, the you know protecting your data, uh, run at that high security level. Get your uh, confidential data files locked down correctly, and then take a look at the vendor community. You know, certainly at SyncSort uh, for all of the the different layers of protection that one can add. So, okay, well, we have one more section that uh, I'm going to skip today. Um, you can take a look at the slides uh, for the network security capabilities. You know, we're we're kind of out of time here, um, so. Um, see if there's any questions. Becky, uh, you see anything in the, the chat? No, Jeff, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, is there anything that was specifically directed towards you? Um, I didn't. I didn't see any anything here either. So, so we will. Uh, um, in fact, uh, it, you know, since there's no questions, let me just cover these slides quickly, and uh, you guys can can uh, hang on and uh, for a little bit extra time if you'd like, or you can look at listen to a recording in the future if you need to run. So, so let me cover these slides, and then uh, that'll be a good use of our time. Right. So we we talked about uh, hardware technology early on, um, and you know I've got just a couple of slides to talk about about firewalls. Uh, intrusion detection, events, uh, intrusion detection and prevention systems. You know, intrusion monitors. I'll jump to the next slide and talk about these. So, so really, the the intrusion uh, firewall capabilities, intrusion detection and prevention systems are really there to to help you lock down and control access to your network or networks within your your infrastructure. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on on the technology here, but and I'll just reiterate the, the point about staying current with this technology. Uh, very important, right? So a lot of the, the uh, network-based intrusion detection and prevention systems really need to keep up to date on, on what's happening in the, in the industry from a hacker community perspective, right? So, so staying current, very, very important. Um, the, the intrusion detection and prevention systems, what they're doing is they're looking at all of the traffic uh, coming into your network, and oftentimes even going out of your network, looking for patterns, um, well-established, you know, flows of network, network connectivity, and packets flowing across the network, um, looking for those those you know different type of of attempts to breach your network. 
you know, things like flood the network with uh, lots of data, lots of packets coming in, trying to take down, take down your capabilities or open up holes into your network. Uh, somebody looking for open ports, you know, that type of activity, right? So very, very, very important to to keep up to date on the technology. Um, you know, the, there's certainly a lot of capability today to, to be able to monitor this and be alerted of, of different uh, uh, occurrences of, of uh, potentially, you know, bad hacker activity coming into your, your system. Uh, from a from a security perspective, when you're you're dealing with network traffic, right? So you know probably a lot of, of folks out here have, ta- have heard about uh, SSL system SSL. Um, we'll talk a little bit about about SSL and TLS here. So so the the security of data flowing over a network. You know the way things work that that when you create a a client server. Uh, application. What ends up happening is that uh, you know that that connectivity you know from the client and the server you know is created um, with a with a, a technology that that uh, um, really from a security standpoint is really really not very well protected, right? So so what 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 the technology is called is is sockets, where where you're creating a a connection between a client device like a laptop and a and a server like an IBMI. Um, it can go the other way as well, right? Where IBMI can be be a client and some other system can be the server, right? So we have capability to go go both into and out of, of IBMI. Um, the the default is to send all of the data over the network in the clear, right? So things like uh, you know, passwords, you know, your data that you care about, that you want to transmit, everything's in the clear. Uh, so for many years, um, there was a capability or technology that was called Secure Socket Layer, SSL, um, that this is really from a, from a protection or a, a strength standpoint now is really become obsolete, that we no longer use SSL in the industry, or you should not use SSL. It's still supported, right? So for old applications that are are coded to use the old technology, um, will still work if you allow it. Uh, but from a from a uh, best practices standpoint, you know the industry has moved to to a capability called TLS or transport layer security, which has replaced SSL. And within within both SSL and TLS, there are different versions of the support. You know, so as as one version becomes obsolete because somebody's found a you know an error in the flow, or there's a, a way to, to to penetrate the algorithm or the protocol, um, you know, they become become unsecure, and and they were kind of they're removed from the, the best practices. Now, where we are today is TLS 1.2 is really the 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 minimum layer that you want to use. Uh, TLS 1.3 is coming out. Um, you'll see that fairly soon across the, you know, all of your, your infrastructure. Um, it's coming, you know, TLS 1.2 is coming, but TLS 1.2 is really the gold standard. It's what PCI, the payment card industry requires. Um, TLS 1.1 and 1.2, um, all of that support exists in, in IBM I 7.1 or later. Uh, if you're on 6.1 um, still, you need to move um, because it does not support TLS 1.2. And what you will see is a lot of of, uh, of applications, um, you know, will end up be, be um, being uh, not able to use, be used if they're if they're not using the newer support. Um, the good thing is that that most applications, the way they're they're coded to use the socket interfaces. Um, by default, we'll pick up the TLS 1.2 support. It'd be only those applications that that were written to specifically to, let's say, SSL, you know, V3, um, that will no longer work going forward, right? So, um, but it, it's very important. Also, from a, a TLS standpoint, um, there are are capability that kind of goes along with the whole encrypting the data over the network. Uh, it's a capability called a cipher suite. It's really an encryption algorithm that's used by the TLS capabilities, you know, part of the operating system. 
you know, so all of the, the things we're talking about here for TLS and the Cypher suites, you know, come as part of IBMI. Um, but you want to make sure that your your approved Cypher suite list really, you know, includes just the, the things that really haven't been broken from a security standpoint. Um, that list is here. Um, I suspect that uh, that over time, you know, this list will continue to change. You know, it has a lot in the last four or five years. Um, so you want to want to pay attention to you know what comes out of IBM and use the you know the recommended values for your Cypher suite you know that come with the operating system. A couple of things with digital certificates. <clears throat> so digital certificates are used a uh, number of different cases uh, places on IBM I. Uh, certainly your web servers, uh, but any any application that, that runs a secure version, you know, so using TLS is using a digital certificate. You see the the best practices here. Uh, this is information that comes from IBM. It's really where you want to go with your, your digital certificates. Uh, so you can go out to your digital certificate manager interface, uh, take a look at at the certificates that you're using today, and if uh, if you've fallen behind on, on algorithms or best practices, uh, you can go and get get a certificate that brings you up to the to the recommended uh, levels of security. Okay, so I apologize. I had to pause a minute. I got a little bit of a cough, um, but so so from a from a presentation summary standpoint, right? So, so take a look at the, the security assessment that we talked about, very, very important. Lots of skills out there, uh, both from SyncSort and uh, the vendor community to help you if you need, if you need those type of capabilities. Um, the, the security related system values, uh, again, it's uh, you know, a, an area that you can look at, um, but if you need help from a, uh, from the standpoint of understanding the impacts of changing system values, if you're you're at uh, uh, values that are less than than the most secure, um, how to how to deal with the security audit journal? You know, please reach out to SyncSort, and uh, we can help you. We can help you with all of these different types of projects. Um, we we have a lot of product capabilities to to strengthen your security. Um, so we'd be more than happy to. To talk to you from a, from a sales or a, a services uh, perspective uh, and help you with all your needs. So um, that that will be the the end of the presentation today. I thank you guys all for joining um, and appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we got one question, and it was if this recording is going to be published, and it will be on the Com Europe YouTube channel later this week. Thank you very much for a great presentation. A lot of good information in here. Okay, you're welcome. And thank you, SyncSort, for supporting the community. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.